Good morning, friends. We have our work cut out for us today. I hate to say that to you up front. This is the Festival of the Holy Trinity. And if you ever want to come up with a topic that um, modern people say is a, is a worthless way to try to spend an hour and doesn't have any practical application to young parents, young families, and it's this kind of worship which drives people away into the arms of other churches. So that's what's before us, Holy Trinity. And even if we just went over what is printed on paper for us today without any comment, uh, without any discussion, I think we'd already have an hour's worship because we have the big creed today. Um, I'm glad I didn't hear any groans. We have the big creed to read through today. We're going to do that. We also have the video. We also are in the blue hymnal, so there are uh, places for us to be unfamiliar with it and stumble a little, but we'll do our best. And um, the Holy Spirit is smarter and stronger than we are, so he's going to we have full confidence that we're going to leave here built up for the week ahead. Should we take 30 seconds and let somebody know that we see them? Can we do that? Uh, say hello. The Holy Trinity. We need God to appear to us and make himself known to us. Although every human instinctively knows that God exists, yet he is God and we are creatures and what he's like is beyond our understanding. Further, his ways are contrary to human assumptions about him. So the whole truth about God cannot possibly be discovered by us. Rather, it will need to be uncovered, Bible word, revealed to us. And it is. The written word shows us the glory of God in the face of Christ. This is a glory which saves. Okay, so if you turn the, to the top of the next page, what to expect this morning, Path of Worship is going to be setting one, found in your blue hymn book on page 154. We're going to sing an opening song verse, and then we're going to go to page 154. So our opening praise for Trinity Sunday is 482.
Well, we're not going to page 15 or page 26. We're going to page 154. If you are able to stand, please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go to the top of page, the next page. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are they whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have advised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. We'll sing, Lord have mercy. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us Pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Instead of singing the glory be to God today, which is, as you know, by a long practice, a Trinitarian hymn from the ancient Christian church, we're going to go to that special piece of writing that is something like, you know, when America was formed, we had some special documents that uh, fenced uh, the, the minds and the lives of the people living here in the 13 colonies. The, the creed that we have for today is, is on page 284 in your hymn book. Now, <clears throat> in some ways, it's our own fault if this seems confusing or unfamiliar or long, but the, the Church of Jesus has for, you know, two millennia said, this is one of the three creeds that we hang on to for dear life, because if you lose it, um, you lose the true God. You can see that it's 40, 40 verses, so it's, you know, it's the length of um, some of the Psalms. 
and the the background of the creed, which will which does seem unfamiliar and a little strange to us, the background of the creed is explained in two paragraphs. You could come back to that if you wanted to. Um, I'm going to suggest we do it this way. I don't want to make you read this whole thing, and some of it is just tough to read. So I'm going to read, you can follow, and then sometimes I'll say, congregation read verse X. So you will have some lines to read. Number one, whoever wishes to be saved, you know, and that will mean from Satan and from hell after you die. Whoever wishes to be saved must, above all else, hold to the true Christian faith. Congregation read line two. Now this is the true Christian faith. We worship one God in Trinity, Trinity in unity, without mixing the persons or dividing the divine being. Congregation, line five. For each person, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is the same. But the deity, the Godness of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, co-eternal in majesty. What the Father is, so is the Son, and so is the Holy Spirit. The Father is uncreated. The Son is uncreated. The Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father is infinite. The Son infinite. The Holy Spirit infinite. The Father is eternal. The Son eternal. The Holy Spirit eternal. Yet there are not three who are eternal, but there is one who is eternal, just as there are not three who are uncreated, nor three who are infinite, but there's one who is uncreated and one who is infinite. In the same way, the Father's almighty, the Son's almighty, the Holy Spirit's almighty, yet there are not three who are almighty, but there's one who is almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Congregation, line 16. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit's Lord, yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. Just as Christian truth compels us to confess each person, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, individually to be God and Lord, so the true Christian faith forbids us to speak of three gods or three lords. The Father is neither made nor created nor begotten of anyone. The Son's neither made nor created, but is begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit's neither made nor created nor begotten, but, Bible term, proceeds from the Father and the Son. So there's one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirit. Congregation, line 24. And But all three persons are co-equal and co-eternal, so that in every way, as stated before, the Trinity in unity, three in one, and unity in Trinity is to be worshipped. Whoever wishes to be saved must have this conviction of the Trinity. It is furthermore necessary for eternal salvation that one faithfully believe that our Lord Jesus Christ also took on human flesh. Now this is the true Christian faith. We believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, is both God and man. He's God, eternally begotten from the nature of the Father, and he's man, born in time, from the nature of his mother. Fully God, fully man, rational soul, human flesh, equal to his Father as to his deity, his godness, less than the Father as to his humanity. And though he is both God and man, Christ is not two persons, but one. One, not by changing deity into flesh, but taking the humanity into God. 
one indeed, not by mixture of the natures, God and man, but by unity in one person. For just as the rational soul and flesh is one human being, so God and man is one Christ. Congregation 36. He suffered for our salvation. He ascended into hell. He rose the third day from the dead. Keep going. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and from there will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming, all people will rise with their own bodies to answer for their personal deeds. Those who've done good will enter eternal life. Those who've done evil will go into eternal fire. Last line together. This is the true Christian faith. Whoever does not faithfully and firmly believe this cannot be saved. Athanasius was a man's name. His background is in the paragraphs above what we read. So our, once again, our path of worship for today was on 154. And we are on page, now we're on page 160. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Prayer of the day. Mighty and eternal God, you have taught us to believe and confess your glory, one God in three persons. We ask you to keep us in this faith and confession and to defend us from everything and everyone who would endanger or destroy it. We pray in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Our scripture readings for today, we, there are three. And the first one, very, very familiar to you. In fact, we could probably do this without looking it up. Numbers, one of the books of Moses. Numbers chapter 6, Bible 157. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, that was Moses' brother, Moses was you know, before there were kings, Moses was kind of like a king. He was a prophet, a priest, and a king in shadowy form, the roles that Jesus would one day have. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. The word of the Lord. Our psalm for today is the last of the psalms, and it's, the psalms are by number as if they were page numbers in this book. So to find Psalm 150, we just look for page 150. And this, you can see how this one is done. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, don't want to be confusing, but there's a separate book out now. Some congregations have it in the rows. 
And it's the, it's the book of Psalms, the 150 Psalms. And each Psalm in that book is offered to the reader in different ways. First, you get the text of it. If you just want to use this book devotionally, you can just read through the Psalm. Secondly, there's a shortened version. Um, you know, we do that, we've done that for 30 years, read clipped edited versions of the Psalms in worship. There's a short version. Sometimes someone has taken that Psalm and in an artistic way have written a hymn on the words of the Psalm. That's a gift. Um, not all the Psalms in this new publication have a hymn written on the text of the Psalm, but this one does. So you can see that today we're not going to uh, take the psalm and do it uh, antiphonally or responsive, responsively, where I read a line and you sing a line. But here, it's written as a hymn. So we're going to sing this now. It's Psalm 150. Sing praise to the Lord, you people of grace.
Our second reading today is the one where we'll pause briefly um, for some commentary. First letter from John. <clears throat> you know, when you talk about John the Apostle, you know a couple of things about him. He came from a fishing family. His dad had a fishing company. He and his brother James, who was older than he, uh, worked for their dad. And um, he's called the young one among the apostles. He was the young one. And he winds up being used by the Holy Spirit to write five books in the, of our New Testament. He wrote the good news according to John. And then he wrote three shorties, um, first, second, and third John, a couple of them almost as if they were postcards, hardly a letter. And then he wrote the Revelation um, for people who already knew the story, um, not for people who were new uh, in the faith and would not know what to make of it. So here is uh, John writing in first, the first letter from John, chapter 4, Bible 1520, and we're just reading 13, 14, and 15. We know, we know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. The word of the Lord. Now, Lorna, we're going to do this gospel acclamation. Am I right? Okay, so please rise. Page 161. We'll be, we'll be doing the Easter line, I, just for ease of finding our way. Okay, go ahead, Lauren. from John, it's John chapter 16, Bible 1355. We're reading at verse 12. Jesus is speaking. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when he, the Spirit, of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, he will speak only what he hears, and he'll tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine, that's why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. The word of the Lord. 
We'll be seated for the hymn of the day, which will be 586. to uh, ask you to dig out the inserts from your service folder today. Sorry about this, we just have a lot happening in this worship hour. <clears throat> On the green one, <clears throat> there is a page titled The Holy Trinity. My bulletin kind of clipped the, the heading off of there. Um, <clears throat> so we've, we've just, you worshipers have just come through a, a little season of very dramatic acts of God in, East, in Good Friday, in Easter, in the Ascension, in Pentecost, and now we have one more festival, and it's different from all the others. How? There's no narrative. There, there are no faces that we can think of, no 
No Peter standing up on Pentecost Day and saying, this is what's happening. <clears throat> no group of men and women and kids on the, the hill at Bethany when Jesus ascended into heaven. <clears throat> the whole cast of the Easter drama, Jesus appearing to one, to two, to 12, to 500, uh, all those scattered faces, different faces. Uh, we don't have that today, the Holy Trinity. The other festivals of the Christian church calendar wrap our Lord up in the works and wonders which he has done. For example, at Christ's nativity, we celebrate that God became fully human. At Easter, that he rose from the dead. At Pentecost, that he poured out the Holy Spirit and instituted the church so that all the other festivals of the year speak of our Lord God as he is seen clothed in some work. Do you follow? Those you can see the work. But the Holy Trinity festival shows us how he is in himself, in his divine nature, without any wrappings and works. Here you must soar high above all intellect, leaving all created things far below, and must swing yourself up and listen only to what God says of himself and of his innermost being. In no other way can we know these things. And there the foolishness of God clashes with the world's wisdom and you're part of the world with your brain, your experience. This clashes, it's a clash. Therefore, we should not dispute about how it can be that God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. How can three be one? It is by its very nature beyond all reason. But it should be enough for us that God speaks in this way about himself and reveals himself thus in his word. This is a strengthening message. Who, who knew? Who, who knew that this is a strengthening message? And it should make our hearts joyful toward God, for we see that all three persons, the whole Godhead, that's a made-up word, we, we don't have language for this. The whole Godhead, the, some, somebody did a drawing, it looks like a Mazda Wankel engine. You know what I'm talking about. Um, you try to draw this and it always falls short. Somebody is always trying to explain the Trinity and somebody said, maybe it's like water and water vapor and ice. We all recognize that those are three forms of the same chemical combination. But every, every analogy winds up limping. Um, We see that all three persons, the whole Godhead, turns himself to us. That's the thing, my friends. It isn't that we're studying God in the abstract, God by himself. That, that's one of those where you would use the famous line, you can't handle the truth, and I can't either. You don't, you cannot, your gray matter cannot handle the Trinity. Just admit it. And we can't explain it either. All we can do is say, I do see in the written word where God talks about himself this way. Right? Now you know, I'll finish, he turns himself to us in order that we poor, wretched, miserable humans living in a valley of tears should be helped against sin, death, and the devil. 
that we may be brought to justification, that we may hear God pronounce from his judgment bench, he who is the creator, we live to hear him say, you, I say, not guilty for the sake of my son, about whom you have learned through the work of the Holy Spirit, not guilty, that we may be brought to justification into the kingdom of God and eternal life. Now, <clears throat> there is a real old graphic you can see there. I'm not trying to say you need to love this, but just take a look for a minute at what the, the artist was doing. <clears throat> you have these circles in the back, which are like the spirals in your vacuum cleaner hose. They are meant to try to evoke the idea of eternity. Just, it, it always was, it is now, and it always will be. And there in front of those spirals is the Father. Now you probably think of the Father sometimes as I do, that he's remote, that he is, um, that if it weren't for Jesus, he wouldn't love us. And here he is holding up his hands in the sign of a blessing. You see Jesus sitting next to a manger. Um, you know, this is, this is beautiful and faith strengthening. But the Father did not die for you. And the Spirit did not die for you. The surprising thing is that Jesus died for you. And so the cross is in the center of this picture of the Trinity because of what we read in that line before. The whole Godhead turns himself to us. The whole, if you can imagine this, that this cosmic clash between the devil, a rebellious angel, who would not yield in his strength and beauty and wisdom, he would not yield and serve you. Wouldn't do it. He was too beautiful. He was too precious. He was too powerful. Why should he serve invertebrates like us? Why should he serve worms? He wouldn't do it. So there's this, the Bible describes this war between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. Jesus came, as we read in that creed before, and he took human flesh. The Father did not do that. And the Holy Spirit did not do that. So is it any wonder that in our prayers, the prayers of the church, which you've heard a thousand times, it says, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives. This is a marvel that, that Jesus, that God in his son died and contrary to all human experience and all science, he lives. And so you have the picture there both of the manger and of Jesus, the man of sorrows, uh, embracing the cross of all things, you know, not, not turning away from it, but embracing it. This is the way that God turned himself toward you. <clears throat> if, you ha if you were a citizen of a country which was in a desperate struggle for survival in war, you would think, what weapons are at our disposal? What means, financial and uh, human, treaties, what do we have going for us? The thing that the Trinity says to us is, all that God is, 
all that he has is invested in you. That is mind blowing. He doesn't exist calm and unruffled and happy by himself in some distant galaxy. The scripture said this. See if you can follow this. God who said, let light shine out of darkness. You know, at creation, day one. God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us light, the knowledge of the glory of God. That's not God in the abstract. The glory of God in the face of Christ. In the face of Christ. There is a glory which doesn't annihilate us. There is a glory which doesn't fry your circuits. It's the glory which saves. You see in that old, old picture, how are you finally going to picture the Holy Spirit? The artist chose to make seven lights, seven candles, seven torches burning which is the way that John wrote in Revelation that before the throne of God, the Holy Spirit was there and, and John could see seven candles or seven torches burning. Before we say amen, I would like you to take the other insert, which is tan cream, and turn to the side that has a graphic on it. I know that Luther said in our, that little reading before that there's no narrative. And so it's hard for us to think about the Trinity. You, you recognize the picture. The first human beings being driven out of God's paradise in their broken condition. God did not want them to live forever eating of the tree of eternal life in this broken condition. And so he drives them out of paradise, puts an angel with a flashing sword so they could not return. You see how the artist here did something helpful and clever by showing that the serpent followed them out. Um, he who was the author of uh, your pain and misery accompanied them, and you don't need any explanation or any more experience of that in your own life. So here's our summary. Lord, is the doctrine of the Holy Trinity practical? I want something that will help me be a better person today. Everything the Father is and has and does. Everything the Son is and has and does. Everything God's Spirit is and has and does is for you. Is at your service. Is marshaled against Satan. So if you can't understand how the Godhead works, well, join the club. Neither can I or anybody else. But it is important for us to say, I very clearly have heard this and seen this in God's word. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's probably the best known, although we do the triple blessing at the end of every service. You sang this before. I'm just going to leave you with it. Yield all that you are to worship the Lord. See, life is a song. Each moment a chord. Let harmonies flourish and melodies soar. Let all that has breath praise our Lord evermore. Hallelujah.
We spoke a creed already before, so we would be on page 164 where there are prayers and where we're going to see our monthly video. Um, with a little bit of humility now, uh, I'm going to mention something which some of you are, some of you know, and, and, and not trying to be sensational here, but yesterday at our church council meeting, our brother in Christ, Keith Winter, talked about how, what a rugged weekend Keith and Sylvia have. They were to drive up to the way north in Minnesota for Sylvia's talked to Sylvia's doctor who worked on her back and then beat it back to Omaha in time for Keith to go in um, because a mass has been found on his lung. So no one knows what this means. It has not been diagnosed. No biopsy has been taken, but you can imagine what your sister and brother are, uh, are up against this weekend and also is when we get out of worship today. Another of your Christian family, Betty Johansson, is at her mother's bedside now. Um, and she is um, apparently with her in her final hours or moments. So, um, you know, to any of us to be with the person who brought you into the world, who has been in the world every day that you have been. And even if you're not thinking of her, that she's out there ahead of you somewhere, um, grappling with life and difficulties, sins and hopes as a believer. So Betty is with her mom uh, at her bedside. <clears throat> so we will pray. Father, we <clears throat> are grateful that we have a family of believers that goes beyond our blood relations. People who are interested in us in a good way and who hold a tremendous gift and power, uh, which we cannot prevent them from exercising, which is to talk to you about us and to pray for your mercy uh, on us individually as our needs are known. And today we pray for Betty, um, who is um, shaken to her core, and we're grateful she can be at her mom's side. Betty, who has often taken her mom a meditations magazine and, and read with her. We also pray for Keith and Sylvia, uh, both for Sylvia's um, checkup on her spine and also for Keith, who has to face the unknown. Sometimes it's worse than knowing what you're up against. So um, give them cheerful and contented hearts and let us not fail to pray for them and to let them know that they were in our prayers as they went through their difficult week. Amen. Our offering is at the door of the chapel. We'll see the video. Henry. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Education makes a difference, not just in academic achievement, but also in developing Christian character. A powerful illustration of how education can transform lives is on display at Kingdom Prep, a new Wells Area Lutheran High School in Milwaukee. When we got started, it's hard as a new school coming into a space and just saying, okay, make us number one on your list, right? 
It started off with eighth grade young men coming to build a high school. And so these eighth grade young men came to Wednesday night founders groups and they started designing one at a time, uh, the mascot, the school day, what we would wear, uh, where we would go on Exploration Thursday trips. How do we create a space to be able to continue to serve kids from the city? How do we make uh, young men who are ready to be men of the kingdom? Anybody else got something that they want to say from what Mr. Spurrier was talking about when he was last up here? Cam, what you got for me? Loud and proud. We now have about 200 young men, and you now have these originally eighth graders. They're now the seniors who've gotten much bigger, much stronger, uh, much more biblically centered and they are now raising up the next generation of freshmen who will come in here next and carry on the legacy. Oh, it's all boys school. I was already struggling in middle school because you know there's females distracting me. All right, I'm going to an all guys area. Think of it as a football team and everything runs smoothly. And so when we first uh, came up with the idea of an all boys school, we like brotherhood. We want to be brothers, we want to be a family. Even with our lunch, we have a family style lunch where everybody comes to sit down at the table. We have a table captain. You want to work with your family through the hard times, the good times, you know, the bad times. You always with your family. The next line, lazy hands make for what? Poverty. True? Apostle Paul says, carry each other's burdens, and in so by doing, you fulfill the law of Christ, which is obviously to love one another. The way that we built brotherhood through Christ and God is like really important because He's like the main building block. He's what we all base ourselves around. And like being able to talk to other guys about that is one of the best parts about the school. I have a group of people that I can talk to about religion or if I'm struggling, they're always there to talk to me. They'll bring up Bible verses or anything like that. Or you're on game all the time and you keep on missing Bible study because you're on your phone trying to get so whatever hurts my brother hurts me. So if my brother needs help with something, I'm gonna be there to help him out. We're only as strong as our weakest link, right? Uh, we're here to constantly be being able to bend over and pick a brother up. Fixing whatever traumas and things that they've experienced within themselves. Counseling is a big piece around here. And how do we allow them to be able to express themselves? We live in a city where like, there's a lot of bad influences and you're not really able to be yourself. You're not able to be vulnerable. I'll preach the gospel to him, right? But I'll give him some practical wisdom in here and say, young man. I was pretty down on the situation I was in and coming here, it grew my faith with God because as I was in a low place in life, um, I went to God. Your personal mission statement should be timeless. And then the realization of, I need my Lord to get me through these tough times and it helped a lot build my um, faith. Number two, you can find truth for your life by reading God's word. Cause you know, everybody has stuff going on at home or things in general and like being able to go to a place where you can feel comfortable and like be vulnerable, talk to people without being judged. We're preparing young men for leadership, uh, for trade school, for college, for entrepreneurship, you name it. I plan on going to culinary school. I plan on going to Northwestern Michigan. They have a really good uh, culinary program. I want to help out students. I want to help people get the things that I wasn't able to have. I love to just give back to the future generations, basically. So MLC is a school for teachers. It'll help me keep my faith while I'm still up there. And two, I can still play football. All the things that I've learned, aside from academics, like all the life lessons teachers have taught me, all the good values and principles, I'm bringing out all with me as well. They're starting to recognize what does it mean to live in this kingdom first and foremost. Uh, I think it's going to pay off in big ways. I think they're going to be husbands to their wives, fathers to children, um, community leaders, certainly church, you know, congregational leaders. It's going beyond just getting a diploma. It's beyond just the work that you pour in but how are you intrinsically a better young man? But to be able to do a, a work from my heart and to continue to live towards his glory and everything that I do, like, you can't beat it, man. You can't beat it. Your personal mission statement will help you to maintain your value. I would dare say the first and best thing we have going for us is 
kingdom first, the word first, right? And after that, everything else kind of falls into place. We're doing this for Christ. And so that's where the kingdom part comes in. You know, we are doing it to serve Christ. So that's what it's all about. Kingdom Prep is four years old, which means the first class of students has become the first class of graduates, heading out into the world to serve the kingdom. And overall enrollment at our Wells Lutheran Elementary Schools and area high schools is up 10% this year, a tremendous blessing that means thousands of additional children are hearing about Jesus every day. Okay, we have to find our end of the service now. <clears throat> I think we're on page 171. Normally we would sing our last hymn after the benediction, but that looks like that is slotted into the service right here. And that hymn is 549.
171. We're going to read the Lord's Prayer from the left hand column. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please, Henry.